Um, good morning and good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's webinar, SCOS, a global community sustaining open science infrastructure researchers need. Um, this is sponsored by the ARL Scholars and Scholarship Committee, and it's great to see members of the committee here on the meeting. Uh, my name is Judy Rutenberg. I'm the Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy at ARL. And for the past few years, I've had the privilege of representing ARL on the SCOS board, currently chaired by Susan Haig um, at the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. I am really pleased to welcome all of you to this conversation, along with our speakers. Um, and we're going to post our speaker bios in the chat. Um, we have Rosalie Lack, SCOS coordinator, Sean Sutton, Dean of University Libraries at the University of Arizona, who serves on the SCOS Technical Advisory Group, Hillary Hanahoe, Secretary General at the Research Data Alliance, and Moran Greenpeter, Head of Open Science Operations at Software Heritage. Um, RDA and Software Heritage are, of course, part of the SCOS family of infrastructures recommended for financial support. Um, before I turn the mic over to Rosalie, I just want to remind you that as an ARL-sponsored event, this meeting is governed by the ARL Code of Conduct, um, which is now in the chat. Um, please feel free to use the chat for questions and comments throughout the meeting, um, and our speakers may or may not get to them while they're speaking, but we will um, get to them and also leave time for Q&A at the end of the presentations. So with that, um, over to you, Rosalie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to share screen and get going here. So hi, um, I am the uh, SCOS coordinator representing um, SCOS, the Global Sustainability Coalition of Open Science Services. And today I'm just starting my short presentation with um, a little bit of a maybe provocative statement, imagine a world without open infrastructure. And this title comes from a blog post that we recently posted on the SCOS website. And here is a link to that. And you all will get these slides and or uh, you'll have my email. I can certainly send them to you. And this blog post was really talking about the financial challenges of non-commercial open infrastructure that there are unpredictable revenue streams and this focus, so there's many challenges that some listed here and the focus of the funding model is still very much on project funding versus operations funding, which is what's really needed, which I think that sounds familiar to us from many angles. Um, and overall, this the biggest challenge is this concept of, you know, why, why fund a free resource? And of course I say free in quotes because they are not free. Obviously, they are um, take lots of funds to maintain, to create, to stay innovative, and to keep meeting uh, the needs of the community. But access to them is tends to be free or at reduced prices. So the, the there's a hidden cost that um, users not seeing. Sorry, oops, oops, sorry. So if we look at um, if we think about a possible, sorry, I'm trying to move the screen so I can see my own slides. If we look at a possible future of imagining a world without open um, infrastructure, primarily, again, non-commercial open infrastructure, we can think about technical development that's, for example, locked up or proprietary systems that doesn't allow for interoperability, which is so important in our world. And I'm not gonna go through all of these. And the other one that really, um, personally is just really I'm passionate about is that these these infrastructures are aligned with library values. As librarians, we're thinking about equitable access for everyone. We're thinking about long-term preservation. And these are not necessarily values and priorities for commercial adventures. And so these are things that you get along with these open infrastructures that are aligned with your own um, values. Oh, sorry. So as a way, um, I'm having technical issues moving forward here. So as a way forward, ironically, um, we're looking at ways to really shift funding priorities so that we're collectively funding these open infrastructures. 
And it's in this um, arena and in this context that SCOS was formed back in 2017. So SCOS's aim is to really help sustain vital, vital non-commercial open infrastructures that support the implementation of open science. And what, what do we do? So I actually just joined SCOS a couple months ago and I had to really wrap my brain around what is it that SCOS does? Cause it's, it's not a model that you've seen before. I'm sure I'd never seen it before. So the idea is that SCOS endorses infrastructures for investment. So what that means is, and Sean is gonna talk after me and, and give you a little more details about this, but every year a couple um, infrastructures apply to SCOS and they're chosen and these are and when they're, when they're chosen, they're chosen because they're critical, essential infrastructures, and they've gone through a, a vetting process. They're looked at in sort of a 360 review of financially, their strategic planning, their staffing, their usage. And so once they've gotten this endorsement from SCOS, then, um, then SCOS moves forward with presenting these, these infrastructures to consortia, to individual libraries, and those consortia individual libraries donate and or pledge directly to the infrastructures. So SCOS's role is really one of endorsement, promotion, and also once an infrastructure is in the SCOS family, as we call it, then they also are exchanging best practices among each other and, um, and looking for efficiencies of how to connect and work together. So, um, and well, I could go into details about that, but I'm gonna stop there. Um, so SCOS is headquartered under Spark Europe, but I want to be clear, it is a global organization that is working in um, North America and Canada, US and Africa, Latin America, Australia, Australia, New Zealand, um, globally, although headquartered in Europe. So to date, um, since forming, SCOS has had over 6 million euros, which I didn't do the conversion to the US, but you guys can all do it. I think it's, that would be like, go up a little bit, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> Either way you look at it, over 6 million um, euros pledged to from 340 institutions. So, and those institutions currently are primarily from Canada, Europe, and Australia. So we're, we haven't seen a lot of pledges from the US at this point. And the SCOS family infrastructures are these, right now there's 15 of them. So many, maybe you will recognize, some maybe you won't. Um, and today it's great to have Software Heritage and RDA presenting. They're the latest to join the SCOS family. Oops, and so I just wanted to show this slide pretty quickly, although I know it's difficult to read, but what this is is a, an exercise where we show this, the technical connections between the different infrastructures. So the ones in the center are the SCOS infrastructures, and we wanted to show how they're connected to each other, but also how they're so connected to the larger um, non-commercial open, open infrastructure ecosystem. So again, the, these infrastructures that are chosen by SCOS, that are vetted by SCOS, you can be confident that they are critical infrastructures, are highly connected, they're highly interoperable and, and leaders in, their, in, their, um, in the work that they do. So I have a series of slides here that I'm gonna go through pretty quickly because this content is actually on our website. And also again, you'll get these slides, but I wanted to just give you a sense of um, throughout the years, we have, I think we're up to our fifth cycle now. So we have um, each year chosen a couple of infrastructures. And on this slide, you can see the target is what is requested by the infrastructure and the percentage is how much of that percentage has been met. So our first year was DOAJ and, and Sherpa Romeo. And then in year two was DOAB Open OA. Um, open citations, PKP, and, and you can see just quickly the targets and how much those were uh, met. In our third cycle was archive, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Redelic, if you're not familiar with, you should be, um, you may not be. Uh, DSpace, and then again, you can see the, the target amounts and percentage reached. In our fourth round of uh, 
funding was, or fourth cycle was Dryad, La Referencia, and RR. And then um, fifth round is, are the two resources that we're gonna hear from today. So just to stop on that one a moment. And so you can see that, yes, we are really proud of the raising of the 6 million euros. Um, and a lot of great work has been done with those fundings and all of this, every, everything's very transparent on, in the SCOS funding. You can see um, the full applications that each of these infrastructures has given, and you can see their annual reports, what work they did with the funds that they, they got. And you could see also, as, as, you, as I was going through these, that we're in recent years not meeting targets as much as, as we had in the initial years. And so we are really looking to libraries and, and, and research institutes and others to really think about how to support these infrastructures. And broadly, three things that um, to think about, promote, join, fund. So promote, I say, for sure, something like what we're doing right now, which is talking about open infrastructure. So if you have an open infrastructure that you use, that you love, you know, think about having a meeting with your colleagues and sharing that infrastructure. Think about sharing it with your faculty members. Um, also think about, if you think about joining, in that sense, all of you are leaders in your library community. So think about joining an open infrastructure, joining their board, joining an advisory group, and sharing your expertise with them. And finally, um, funding, of course. And at this point, we really do need all of us to be rethinking what we fund and why. And I'm not going to go into details about how to fund through SCOS, but I am more than happy to talk with you. So there's my email address, send me an email. But we have models, for example, where you can fund as a subscription. And so it should be pretty simple for your um, for your accounting system. And, and the goal that we all want to be working toward is open science built on open infrastructure. So keep that kind of mantra in, in your head and in your mind. And, um, and think about SCOS as a place where you can go to know that these are vetted critical infrastructures that, that need your support. So, and please reach out to me. I'd love to talk more about SCOS. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Turn it over to um, I think I'm out Sean. next. Yeah, thanks, Rosalie. So uh, I want to dig in uh, a little deeper into process on how SCOS uh, works. Uh, basically, you've got um, the SCOS board, but then there's a technical advisory board that advises the board uh, when it comes to, well, a lot of different things that I'll cover briefly uh, today. Uh, the, the advisory board is composed of representatives of members of SCOS as well as experts proposed by board members. Uh, the advisory group is international in scope. Uh, I think there's 11 of us currently on the advisory group. Uh, we all have different backgrounds in open access, open science, policy, uh, technical matters, financial uh, support and, and what that looks like. So we, we really do, as Rosalie say, said, take kind of a 360 view uh, of, of applicants. And, and the way I see it is we really have a partnership with the board, uh, especially around the vetting of expressions of interest and the, uh, the applications, the proposals for those who are chosen to go into kind of the final round. And as a result of that, there's really two extensive levels of vetting that happens before uh, the uh, cohort is chosen uh, for recommended funding. Uh, and I think that's a really important part of this. Uh, for SCOS in general, I think it's a wonderful resource for anyone who's interested on where are kind of legitimate, fundamentally important, impactful uh, open science, uh, open scholarship infrastructures, this vetting process helps to assure that that's the case. And um, I think there's value in that, whether a given institution decides to, to give funding to uh, one, of the, uh, one of the recipients of, of the uh, recommendation or not, there's, there's a real educational value, I think, to, to what SCOS does. That's part and parcel of those vetting processes. 
So the technical advisory group is responsible for uh, a few different things. Uh, one is working with the board uh, in proposing strategic areas of funding that help to feed into what the annual call for expressions of interest um, emphasize and focus on. Uh, secondly, we evaluate expressions of interest and then forward feedback to the SCOS board for its decision. Out of those expressions of interest, the board selects a handful of finalists, if you will, who are invited to submit full proposals. And then out of that finalist pool, uh, uh, usually two or three uh, organizations are chosen for recommendation for funding. Uh, one thing I think that's really important about our process within the advisory group is that we do asynchronous scoring according to standardized criteria. Then we have a conversation and then both the quantitative and qualitative feedback goes to the board to help inform their um, decision making. Uh, and that occurs both for the expressions of interest as well as the full proposals from the finalist group. So you have that kind of individual scoring according to standardized criteria, followed by a discussion, followed by a transmission of all that information to the board to help inform um, their decisions. And uh, when I get to the end of my comments in a minute or two, uh, I'll show you um, the criteria. And that's one thing I think um, is important about SCOS is very transparent about the criteria it uses to evaluate uh, the expressions of interest and um, the proposals. Uh, I should also add that within the group, we're very international uh, in scope and, and often, if not always, uh, not only representing ourselves, but representing uh, our home institutions or consortia or organizations we're involved with. So for example, um, I serve as basically the Association of Research Libraries representative on the advisory board while Judy does the same on, on the full board. So ARL does have representation through both my involvement and Judy's uh, involvement uh, as well. And then one other uh, thing the advisory group does is uh, reviews annual reports uh, that are submitted by previously approved applicants. So that's another important part of this process is it's not just we're recommending you for funding, uh, good luck, but there's actual reports that are due to her, um, how things are going uh, and follow up. And as Rosalie said, part of kind of this family, this cohort on an ongoing basis. So we review those two according to standardized criteria and provide feedback on where we think the uh, requirements have been met and if they haven't been met, um, what that looks like. And perhaps there can be some follow up um, there. So uh, I'll just close by seeing if I can share my screen here real quick and um, show you. Uh, this is the SCOS website, and so I just briefly wanted to show you um, what the application form for this past year looked like. Uh, in addition to all the demographic information, we have things like the value of the service to open access or open science community. So you can see there's various elements where uh, the applicants describe um, the value they bring, a whole list of stakeholders and how the service benefits these various stakeholders. Then we get into technical details. Um, relevance, demographic data that shows impact and significance, uh, how you engage with community. Uh, then we get into financial matters, um, costs, both uh, in the two years coming up to your application, as well as what you're projecting out, uh, what you're requesting. And again, it's important to remember with this model, SCOS isn't providing the funding it's providing the vetting and um, the recommendation for others to um, help meet this goal. Uh, and then sustainability measures um, and so on, uh, plans for the future, what if things don't get, work out, your governance uh, infrastructure and processes and things like that. So again, very transparent. Uh, and we use the same criteria within the advisory group to, uh, to vet proposals and, and make our recommendations. So uh, I guess the last thing I'll say is just to uh, reiter reiterate the value I think that SCOS with its various cohorts of recommended um, services brings. Uh, for, it, it's hard to track out there, I, I think. There's a lot of open infrastructure out there. What's the most impactful and um, 
deserving of support. And I think SCOS helps to identify that. Also, Ros uh, Rosalie uh, mentioned earlier, that graphic is a great demonstration that when you're supporting one of these services, you're also indirectly supporting a lot of the related infrastructures and programs that they connect out with. So that's kind of the advisory board angle on this. Uh, I'm now gonna hand off to Hillary from Research Data Alliance, one of the latest cohort of uh, services recommended for funding. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. And while I share my screen with you, thank you so much to the Association of Libraries for organizing this webinar for us uh, today and giving us the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the two infrastructures that, uh, sorry, for some reason my screen, some of those things that you don't want it to do. Uh, smoke prison, that's it, right? Um, so, uh, uh, right, so I am the Secretary General of the Research Data Alliance and um, Rosalie asked you to imagine a world without uh, open infrastructure and there was a fairly barren desert uh, image. I ask you to think about uh, a world without electricity or a world without light and how would we cook and how would we charge our phones and how would we even be talking to each other and how would we cool the very hot environment that Sean apparently is in at the moment in Arizona. So, um, and this, if you think about it, is that is like a world without data. And light helps us find our way in the dark, of course. And we often refer to uh, data as light or as a natural resource. So data is really essential, but of course it needs structure and it needs value. It needs experts as well. And indeed that's why the Research Data Alliance was uh, set up. It was set up to make sure that there's structure, value and expertise in managing data across the world. And I'm sure some of you have seen this uh, graph before, but this is the uh, growth, exponential growth of digital data. Uh, since 2010. And as you can see last year, we produced 120 zettabytes of data. And by next year, we're apparently going to produce 180 zettabytes. And to what does that mean? So to put that into perspective, it means that if a zettabyte were a length, then it would be equivalent to 1,300 round trips to the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's 769,000 kilometers, right? To go to a round trip to the moon. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot of data. But remember that not all data that we produce digitally does actually need to be stored and accessed and preserved. But how do you know what to keep and how do you know what to throw away? Um, so, well, of course, then when you have found the answer to that question, you also need to give the value to the data and discover new ways of uh, using that data to create value and to address what many uh, of us in the open science field are doing is to address the grand challenges of society. Mm -hmm. And if you think here, this image portrays um, work that was done around wheat data, where farmers in remote areas of Africa wouldn't have had access to essential climate and agricultural data to assist them in making accurate and life-saving crop management decisions if data was not made available in a structured and uh, valuable way. Without community activities around digital preservation and curation, libraries and librarians around the world, including yourselves, would probably be struggling to create these digital archives and replicas of artifacts. And of course, as you know better than we do, that uh, libraries are the gatekeepers of um, memory, history, society, culture, and many other things. So uh, they are really important. And what about COVID? Remember in COVID, the acceleration of the availability of uh, data that was made available. And, but that data wouldn't have been valuable and it wouldn't have helped to make um, us find vaccines and also thera therapies and also to create um, repositories of data that can support in future pandemics if we hadn't have provided some guidance and funding on that. 
So what has that got to do with the organization that I have the great privilege and honor to represent here today? Well, the Research Data Alliance is a global community of data experts that work on the many complexities of digital data. And indeed, they are the producers of those three examples that I just showed you. And that's just three examples of over 150 different solutions that this wonderful global community uh, from across all types of stakeholders and all countries. We have 14 and a half thousand individual members who give their time, their expertise and their knowledge to support and to find the solutions of data. And I like to call that infectious generosity. And I think it's very much at the heart of open science um, this generosity of spirit of finding a solution that you need, but also giving it back to the community. The Research Data Alliance has a very high uh, and ambitious vision that researchers and innovators can openly share and reuse data across technologies, across uh, disciplines and across countries to address the grand challenges of society. And we do that by building the social and the technical bridges. And I showed you some of the technical bridges, but we also create community, uh, provide opportunities for networking and interaction, because it's this crosswalk of different disciplines, communities and stakeholders that actually helps to accelerate and to find the solutions by sharing across different uh, domains and also technological areas. We've seen that there's more acceleration. We are built on six very important guiding principles. Every single thing that the community does is open. It's all driven by consensus. It's inclusive. We strive for harmonization, which also means trying to simplify sometimes uh, things in the world and not create more standards or competition or duplication of efforts. It's the community that decides what we need to work on. And everything that we do is nonprofit and technology neutral. And the community works together in three very you know, concrete ways through working groups, interest groups, and communities of practice. And everything that we do is, as I said, open and available on the website. Though I do have to give a disclaimer, we are transitioning in a new website at the moment. So there are some challenges to find sometimes some of the information, but do work, bear with us. We have been around for 10 years and uh, ten, transitioning a 10 year web platform is quite challenging. So I would like to say that, of course, data needs structure. It needs value and data needs experts. Data needs the Research Data Alliance and the Research Data Alliance needs you. I would ask you to consider the SCOS funding, uh, specifically in the RDA cases, to support more standards and enable best practice research data management. But we also have a focus on trying to ensure that it is truly a global organization and that we are um, and support those in the global south or the southern hemisphere, which have perhaps less resources. You can ensure us to do that by uh, contacting me. And one of the things I would like to say is we have organizational members who support us. We have this model already. And they have, we have a wonderful group of almost 100 organizational members and our Scots pledgers, uh, pledgers are invited to join that assembly where we share all the insights and updates on the Research Data Alliance, but also offer value to these organizations as organizations who truly believe in open science and research data management. So I thank you for your time and uh, I hope you will consider RDA. And I think I pass over to Moran, is that correct? Yes, thank you, Hilary, for passing the baton to me. And hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen as well. Uh, let me see if I can do that easily. Yes. And um, yeah, I can do that. OK, great. Uh, so I'm very happy being here and meeting you all uh, online. Um, my name is Maren Greenpeter. I'm Head of Open Science Operation at Software Heritage. Software Heritage is a source code library, and I will talk about that in a minute. Um, we are now, um, we have been launched by INRIA, the um, research center in France. And without further ado, I will talk about some software aspects. So 
the first question that I bring to you is what do we archive and what is software? Now, some people would say that they don't really understand software and software is more like magic to them. And around software, we have what we say, what we have, the project, the community, and the ideas that software brings to us. And those are not digital artifacts. We uh, focus our, our effort on the digital artifact, but not all digital artifacts. The source code is the place where the human knowledge is living because the source code can be read by humans and is written for humans to read. And there's a very large digital collection of source code artifacts that should be preserved. Now, software is becoming a pillar of open science alongside open access repositories and open data sets repositories. And the links between these uh, artifacts is really important. Now in academia, software has multiple facets. It can be a tool that, you, that researchers use to process data. It can be a research outcome produced in a research workflow. And it can be the object of research. For example, when someone is uh, researching the gaming history um, and looking at, into this software. And it is fragile because it can disappear. We are at a turning point because software is increasingly recognized by the larger international community. In the Paris call from 2019, the call promotes, promotes software development as a valuable research activity and research software is a key enabler for open science and open research. And in the recommendation, the UNESCO recommendation from 2021, we see that the open scientific knowledge includes open source software. Source code must be included in the software release and made available on openly access, accessible repositories. Ah. This is not what I wanted to, to do. Okay, <laughs> moving to the research libraries. You have a pivotal role when it comes to software preservation because software requires a global and coordinated effort because we have a long road ahead to make it available, to make it findable, traceable, and to ensure that the reproducibility crisis is not a crisis anymore. Now, have you met software archival requests? in your library organization? This is a question that I sent to you because I did uh, visit the website, the um, association website, and I saw some nice blog posts about software, but I would lo love to hear about that in the chat, even though I can't look at the chat at this moment. But if you did have this uh, request, I would be very interested to hear about that. And a special guest software deserves a special library. And for that, Software Heritage was created to bring this uh, technology to software source code. It is an international and non-profit initiative launched in 2016, shared with a shared vision with some very um, interesting organization and supported by a large group of sponsored donors and members. And is a very, very, the largest collection of software source code. So we have more than 300 million project archive at, well, the date is from, from yesterday, so it grows every day. And we have more than 19 billion unique source code files. So it's very, very huge collection. Um, and it is an open infrastructure collecting, preserving and sharing all source code and we have some features available for the academic partners by submitting software source code archive. We have that with publishers and other scholarly infrastructures. Well, again, I do this all the time. Okay, uh, and we are crawling the web like the archive.org um, wayback machine, going and fetching source code into this archive. We have the possibility to save code now um when exactly like the wayback machine and we do rescue operations for closed um closed forges um unfortunately we know that infrastructure might um might disappear so we do that as well and so 
we are serving the scholarly ecosystem as the baseline, the universal software archive, on top of which the scholarly ecosystem can connect to with scholarly repositories that archive not only software, but data and uh, publications and publishers that want to connect to the software artifacts that are archived in Software Heritage and aggregators that, um, well, keep all these links alive. And with that, I must say that we do cater also other um, domains, not only academia, and it is important to acknowledge that most software is not produced in academia, but academia depends on a very large web of software, which might be outside of academia. We have this um, existing collaboration in European projects and with um, existing platforms. And now we are joining, we joined uh, thanks to the SCOS um, uh, submission. We've been um, joining this family and uh, we are happy to be here, part of this family. Now in this fifth pledging round with RDA, we also are active in the RDA with Software Source Code Infrastructure Group, and we want to keep this connection and really building this um, um, network of, of connections and interoperability between infrastructures. And now, what did we create for you so that you could, um, could join the effort and support software heritage and our mission? We have the archives and libraries interest group where supporters are acknowledged, but also get access to this mailing list and um, a forum, a channel where we discuss um, software archive dilemmas and when where you can ask your question and get assistance about software uh, archival. We also have sponsorship levels that are higher than the uh, supporter benefits, where you also get access to the general assembly of the um, software heritage sponsor. And, and with that, um, I would love to hear also what are the needs in your organization and community when it comes to software. I don't know if people are writing in the chat. Again, I can't see it right now. Questions are welcomed as well, but if you have some needs that come up with software in your community, again, I would be happy to, uh, to discover that with you. And behind the scenes, before I leave, I would like to say that we have a very dedicated team uh, building this infrastructure, which is a technical challenge, building a community. We also have an ambassadors program where we have also a representative from the libraries community. So we are building um, uh, for the long term, the technical solution, the community solution, and um, engagement with other infrastructures and with other um, uh, domains. With that, I thank you for your attention and I leave some time for questions. Thank you so much. I, I just wanna thank all of our speakers. That was beautiful. I, I really feel very proud to be part of SCOS <laughs> um, and, and very um, just uh, pleased to have heard all these wonderful presentations today. I hope that you are too. 